Hi again, everybody. Welcome to Unanchored Boston. As always, we are brought to you by Cold Springs RV, your destination for all things in where? Where New Hampshire, of course, and the great George Gray, the big wheel, we call him, at George Gray's Lexington Toyota 409 Mass Ave in Lexington. Well, Lobel and I were sitting around, we're saying, with all that's going on with Bill Walton, the Celtics in the NBA Finals, there's really only one guy that has seen it and experienced it all and, and can really just navigate his way through this. It's the HOF Big O, Glenn Ordway. Bob Lobel, take the formal introductions right now. Well, Glenn has been on uh, more than once in the past and has, you know, has always been a hit. So I'm telling you, I did this week has been amazing. I mean, you can jump ahead and think about the Celtics and maybe Dallas or whatever. We go, we'll talk about that. Sure. Which, of course, you know, plugs Glenn into this perfectly because of his experience with the Celtics and Johnny Most and all those years on, on you know, the Big O and EEI and talk show and, and all that. But the Walton thing was the thing that pushed us over the edge. I... I cannot tell you that in every place I have gone this week and almost every person I have seen this week and talked to has opened with the line, gee, bad about Walton. Yeah. Or, you know, too bad about Bill Walton. What do you think about Bill Walton? The whole, it, it really has been overwhelming. And I just cannot remember that ever happening before. But I guess we've never had like, we he's our generation guy he's a generational yeah. guy for us and uh has been for so many people not only ucla but also this the celtics and everything else and the deadhead and the, the whole package so glenn was as as mike mentioned um the perfect guest to have and so as he's about to be inducted into the massachusetts broadcasters hall of fame on the 13th of june here in um in Boston. We welcome him back from uh, Scottsdale, Arizona on the show. Uh, Glenn, you're, let's take, let's get your initial take. Is that fair, Mike, to go ahead and ask Glenn to give his initial take on, on this Absolutely. whole Absolutely. Absolutely. I like the way you collaborate on the show and you work so well hand in hand <laughs> off of each other. I like that. Yeah, we're good. He, Symmetry he is really, like that's the way it works. <laughs> it's really good. Um, Thanks, you're, you're right about the week and about uh, Walton and, for me, it was uh, it was extremely sad because um, he was one of my favorites, and we had kept in touch. Uh, I mean, you know, the last time he played was back in '87, and I was just the broadcaster. And this is a guy that was so happy to be in Boston, as you guys know. I mean, every day, the first thing you'd say is, "Hey, Bill, how are you?" I'm the luckiest man in the world. You know, he would say that every single day, and oh. You know, he would do things like incorporate, and you've heard the stories in the last couple of days from a lot of people, especially now the people at ESPN where he had been working and where he had been doing the, uh, the Pac-12 games, that he included everybody in everything. I mean, when I hear the stories about taking all the players to the Grateful Dead concert, I can relate. He took me to Grateful Dead concerts. He took everybody in the party. He wanted everybody to be included. He was a guy, one of those guys that is so rare. I can't do this. I meet people, and my wife will introduce me to somebody, and I forget their name, and I have to sit there and come back and ask them their name. I probably will forget your names here in the next 30 minutes or so. <laughs> hey, well, Walton, you? Walton was the greatest at, knowing, at meeting somebody. Let's say the guy's name was Dave. OK, or Pete, he would come back a half an hour later, an hour later or the next time he saw that person and say, David, how are you doing? Peter, how are you doing? He just remembered people. And that is a unique talent that I think it shows that you're embracing everything around you and it's not just about you. And that was Bill Walton. I, it just he's a rare breed. And that is why, because I had friends yesterday out here in Scottsdale say to me, oh, my God. I think going a little overboard with, with Bill Walton. That's all I see on the broadcast, ESPN, Bill Walton. I said, nope, this was a unique guy. I said, think about this. He was as progressive as you get with your politics. We're in a world right now 
where everything is split 50 50 50 percent of the people hate whatever your thought is whatever your your feelings are to a certain specific issue and yet bill walton got along with everybody a hundred percent of the people because he would listen to the other side he would listen to what other people had to say and then obviously he would formulate his own opinion he just was so unique and i'm not even talking about him yet as a basketball player we'll get to that I'm talking about him as a human being. I will tell you this, guys. He went through a real rough period, I want to say, around 2010, 2012. He got into a, a, a bike accident, a bicycle accident, and he was a mess. Um, he has this friend, Mookie, and I used to keep in touch with him to find out what was going on with, with Bill. And Bill had major depression problems. And I sat down uh, – on the phone talked to him one time and he told me that he was actually thinking of ending it he just couldn't you know he it was that depressed and you know obviously he wasn't going to do it but it was one of those things he said that's how bad he felt and he really got much better his wife Lori was terrific in, in getting him rehabbing him and he had got back to the point where you got that Bill Walton smile once again and then obviously as we know so many people are hit by you know, this dreadful disease of, of cancer. And it, it eventually, it eventually got to him. And that was, I think for me, the saddest part is that uh, I think the last time I talked to him was probably about a year ago. I don't know if you guys ever saw this story, but he was um, a big fan of the guy that was running for a very progressive running for mayor in San Diego. And he went out, he campaigned for the guy, put together fundraisers. He was doing everything for the guy. And then what ended up happening, the guy gets elected and then Bill, the guy had promised to fix the homeless problem in San Diego because Bill, it was near and dear to Bill's heart. He really wanted to get those people off the streets and get them into a safe environment with well, a place where they could sleep and get three square meals a, a day. So the mayor did absolutely nothing about it. And Bill kept on getting on his case about it, got nowhere with him. And then finally, it extended to the point where Bill's got a, a beautiful house in Balboa Park, which is right next to where the zoo is. And the homeless people started moving in there because they had nowhere else to go. There were so many homeless people now coming to San Diego. As you guys know, the weather is gorgeous there. It is a perfect environment for somebody who wants to live outdoors, you know, 12 months of the year. And so they invaded Bill's property. And that's where Bill just blew a nut. He went back to the mayor. He pressed the mayor. He said, we need to start uh, doing fundraisers, whatever we can do to build homes so we can get these people in these homes. And the mayor wasn't listening to him. Bill said, enough is enough. Bill went on Access TV for 45 minutes. It's available. You can see it on, on YouTube if you want right now. He blasted this guy and demanded that the mayor be impeached. I mean, this was Bill, an outright activist, but an activist to get shit done. It wasn't, you know, I'm just going to speak and I'm just going to spout out. No, it's not about politics. It's about getting stuff done. And this was in the last, I want to say the last year, year and a half where he had really pressed this mayor and he had been all over him. He showed up all over TV out in San Diego and he was out doing rallies to try to get rid of this guy, mainly because the guy had lied to him. And Bill called him out on it. Uh, you know, similar politics. The guy was, was, was uh, you know, uh, running in his lane. And yet when he didn't perform, Bill was the first one to turn on him and said, it's about results. That's what I loved about that guy. You know, um, many of us used the word stunned when we heard the news. Were you aware that he was sick at all? And I was, I was, I was, but I did not think it was that bad. And I've talked to a couple of his friends since, and apparently the last two or three weeks were pretty bad. And nobody knew what was going on the last two or three weeks. But I, I do know that he had it. But as you know, Mike, a lot of people have different forms of, of cancer, and they're able now because of places like Dana-Farber in Boston and some of the great you know, hospitals we have where we're able in the technology we have. I mean, I've had it. I'm a cancer survivor. We can, we can beat it now. And so, you know, you, you say, oh, okay, he's got cancer. All right. You know, hopefully, you know, he'll be, he'll be fine. But apparently the, the last couple of weeks were, were from what I heard pretty bad. That was the, that was a surprising thing too, uh, for me, Mike. And um, Glenn, I just want to go back to one thing uh, specifically. 
But the thing, well, what I admired more about Walt than anything else was when he overcame his stuttering problem. Yeah. I don't think people realize what a difficult time he had. Yeah. Uh, get it, overcoming personally this ability to talk and think at this, and deal with whatever stuttering issues that he had was kind of a remarkable story in itself. And that really was the start of things. And then, of course, his basketball at UCLA and John yeah. Wooden and the dynasty with, you know, Luel Cinder at the time and, you know, John Vallely and all those guys that, that played together and all those names that come back. Yeah. But then uh, having talked to Jan Volk, who was the general manager, about such a difficult time it was for the Celtics to get him here contractually, dealing with Donald Sterling in San Diego. Right. Uh, and uh, when Walton got here, uh, how he went into Red's office, and, and I think this was in the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, I'm sorry to drop that. That's just a name dropper thing. And it's yeah, not the okay. New York Post. That was yesterday's the New York Post. You've read, you read the Wall Street Journal before, said, Bob? Oh, he had somebody I, read it for him. Come on. Uh, like, you know better. The New York yeah. Post down, okay? Yes. But, yeah. <laughs> and Red said this, you know, Walton Lynn, he was distraught that he wasn't playing up to what he thought was his own abilities as a basketball player. And Red said, I brought you here for three reasons. One, your, uh, for your leadership. Two, uh, for your ability to block shots. And uh, the third one was your just overall attitude mm. and, and you know, ability to get along. With so that, those were just a fascinating guy in so many so many different ways. Well, it was interesting when he came here because the, the, the core group of players that were here were slightly younger than him. And so uh, it was very interesting to see the dynamics because this is the great Bill Walden. This is maybe the greatest college basketball player of all time. This is a guy that if he had stayed healthy would have gone down as one of the top five greatest NBA players of all time. Unfortunately, you know, uh, he did not have that that great health. But the players treated him in that first year when he came to camp and they were uh, training out at um, Hellenic College. You may remember that. You look at the facilities oh, yeah. that the you Celtics and these other NBA teams have now. And I remember Hellenic College, the, the players, the Celtics players had to wait because all the students from this Greek college were still out doing their gym class. So they had to stay on the sidelines. 15 more minutes, guys, and then, then we can have practice. That's exactly how the NBA was in 1986. But the thing about Bill Walton was he came in there, and they were just dumping on him. They were shitting on him. They were playing that game because I think – they wanted to get the best out of him, and they thought he was so ecstatic to be here. That's all he would say every day. He would show up at practice. You know, this is a guy that loves San Diego, still loves San Diego till the day he died. You know, would give you stories and stories about San Diego. And yet he's sitting there, and this is the greatest day of his life. I'm a Boston Celtic. And they were dumping all over him. So now they go through all camp, and there are signs. You guys were there. There were signs where you're sitting there going, oh, my God, that is the old, healthy Bill Walton. He is really going to help this team. And so I know that we look back on the 85-86 the team as maybe the greatest team in NBA history. But I can tell you, and you guys probably remember this, in September that year, in October that year, we were talking like that. Look at the bench. Look at the depth. This could be one of the all-time greatest teams. And then, of course, opening night. The opening night is in New Jersey against the Nets. And the Nets weren't that good. They had um, the other King, and they, they, they weren't a real good team. I think they went 39 games that year, something like that. Celtics were up by 12 after three, and I remember the game – and we're sitting there going, oh, this is going to be fun this year. It fell apart in the fourth quarter. Walton was awful. He had seven turnovers in the, in, the, in the game. I think he scored four points. He was in foul trouble. So he had five fouls, I think, midway in the, in the third quarter. And the Celtics end up losing that game in overtime. And we're all sitting there going, what the hell just happened to the greatest season in the history of mankind? So the game is over. And they're telling us we're out. Uh, we're out in the uh, on the floor, Johnny and I. And they're telling us that Walton is going off in the locker room. And so we uh, get out there and we get into the locker room, 
And Walton is sitting there with his head down, the media around him. He's got a towel wrapped around his neck, and he's going, I am a complete disgrace to basketball. I can't believe the Boston Celtics bought, brought me here. I am a complete disgrace. And I'm looking at the other players, and, and Larry and, and Kevin, the other ones are sitting there laughing at him. I mean, what are you doing? This is one out of, out of 82. What are you talking about? He continued to do it on the bus. And on the plane, he went around the, the plane apologizing to every player for being a, a disgrace to the to the game of, of, of baseball. Dr. Naismith, I apologize. I am a disgrace. <laughs> and he was going on and on and on. Well, we all know the story. He ended up being the sixth player of the year. He got his act together within a couple of games. I think it was uh, maybe a home game in Milwaukee, like two games later. And he was really good. You could see those signs. But that was Bill. And he really believed it. And so I laugh when I watch and I see a lot of the Pac-12 games, not because I care much about the Pac-12 out here in the West, but Walton is so entertaining on these broadcasts. And I've heard him say this many times. He is a disgrace to basketball tonight. <laughs> and every time I hear that, I say, Bill can do that because Bill actually accused himself of being that <laughs> disgrace to basketball. But that, that, that was Bill. He just – Honest, you know, and, and tell you exactly how it was. You know, usually one guy can bring up the level of everybody around him. But this was the reverse because he needed someone or some group of people to, as he, as he said before, they gave me my life back yeah. when I came back, came to Boston, 85, 86. And I think the other 11 guys on the team elevated Walton's play because he played as well as he had played since probably the 77, 78 season um, when he was here in 85 and 86. Yeah, I, you know, the amazing thing about it, Lynchy, was uh, I, I remember the, the conversations early on because they were trying to figure out ways and where they could utilize his, his strength. And I've had people ask me, you know, young people, what was he like as a player? And I said, uh, do you watch uh, Nikola uh, Jokic out in, in Denver? I said he was him. He didn't have the dribble, but what he would get up court would be the great passing ability. Okay. So he'd get that first pass mid court, then they'd get the ball back to him. He'd set up at high post, and then he'd be able to operate. Phenomenal passer, great court vision, great hands around the rim, you know, a little hook shot, just like Jokic, just a, a little bit different. And as I think about it, was I remember they were trying to incorporate with all the different things he did. And I remember the coaching staff trying to go over what we can incorporate and do. And he had such great respect. He's the guy coming in here and he's the great Bill Walton. And you think he wants to do stuff his way. And I remember him just having conversations with Casey Jones in practice and, and saying to Casey Jones, I'll do whatever you want, coach, whatever you want. You, you just tell me, you tell me where you want me to be. I'll be there. He fit in so well because it wasn't about him. It was about all of those other guys. And he knew, I, mean, I remember having a conversation with him. We were doing an interview with him. And this was probably, I want to say, two weeks into it. And I said, what has surprised you the most? And he said, oh, my God, Larry Bird. Oh, my God, he is so freaking good. How about both of those guys on the floor at the same time, Glenn? Oh, they, well, they, the the symmetry in the – it's like you and Lynchy. The symmetry <laughs> and the chemistry that they had, they all knew where everybody was going to be at all times. And how many times did you see them throw that alley-oop pass above the rim for Walton? Because they just knew he was, going to, he was going to be there. But it's too bad when you look back at his career, it's too bad that he wasn't healthy because if he were healthy, we would – I seriously believe we would be talking about him in that same group with, you know, the Jordan and the greats and Kareem. And we would be talking about him as one of the all time greats. Um, the, um, go ahead. I'm sorry, Lynch. So tell me about the grateful dead concert that you got invited <laughs> to. Tell me about it. So um, he apparently went around one day and I forget where we were. So he did this numerous times. This wasn't a one-time thing, but it was a one-time thing for me. And I can't remember where we were. He might have been in uh, in Houston. And he uh, went around and asked all the players to, you know, he's the dead are in town. We're all going to the dead concert or whatever. And I remember Robert Parrish going, who the dead? Who the dead? Who the dead? 
And you know, they were all kind of beside themselves. They didn't know what uh, what to do and uh, and whether to go or not. They did end up all going and have had a great time. But I couldn't believe it. He came up to me and he said, "We're all going to the Dead concert tonight. You're coming." Didn't invite me. He said, "You're coming. You're 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 part of the group. You're coming. We're leaving at whatever time they were leaving, or whatever." And he had. Uh, uh, you know, one of those mini buses. And so we took off and, and we went to the, uh, to the concert and Bill of course got us right there up on the stage, the like stage left or whatever. And it was a wild scene. And of course, uh, Bill was, you know, as always probably at every grateful dead concert. I didn't realize you have to be high to go to a grateful dead concert. <laughs> it's the only way that you realize. And I like the music and it's not uh, great to me, but I, I like the music you have to be high because you have to understand that the songs will go for 20, 25 minutes. And then you're not <laughs> sure when the song ends and then the next one begins. But, um, but he was like, he knew every song and his head was like bobbing, but, but it wasn't bobbing quickly. You know, you go to a Springsteen concert and you, your head's, it was like, you know, like this. And it was, he was uh, just a treat of joy just to watch. And then at the end, of course, we don't leave. We go backstage. And of course, you know, Garcia and Weir, the whole band are all there. And of course they're, you know, all smoking and, and that's what it was about. And, and he, Bill just loved the band. The band loved him. I mean, they worshiped him. Those guys were just that Bill would come back and then Bill would actually bring members of the Boston Celtics in there. That was even, even bigger for them. But it was, um, it was a, a fun night that I'll, I'll never, ever forget uh, well, Glenn I also uh, I just not that we're getting away from Walton here but I do want to ask you this because you brought up Bird in the conversation I know that he's putting up a museum he is in Terre Haute Terre Haute Op and, opening uh, opening today and you're involved in that and I, I think am. it's I think it's a great honor that you're it is. Uh, maybe you should explain a little bit to the viewers and listeners what this is all about, but it's pretty the damn voice cool. Of God, Glenn. You're the voice of God in Terre Haute. <laughs> so, in yeah, uh, Terre Haute. So <laughs> it, you can go to Larry Mu uh, LarryBirdMuseum.com, uh, and you can see the whole layout, and you can make reservations. I I'll tell you what, for Celtic fans, uh, it is a treat. It's not a real large museum, though there are plans to uh, expand beyond where they are right now. But it basically it is Larry's memorabilia, and as you walk through it, uh, it goes through the history of Larry Bird, starting from when he was a little kid playing, you know, local and then Springs Valley at high school and then situation with his parents. And then with with Bobby Knight, um, we uh, kill the, the 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 legend out there that is or the theory that he left because he didn't get along with Bobby Knight. That is absolutely not true. I knew that. Many, many years ago, Bird had told me that story. Larry went to Indiana University. He shows up. He is a timid, shy guy. He was shy and timid when he came here to uh, to Boston. If you remember, you know, his attorney, Bob Wolf, had to, you know, walk him around everywhere because Larry was just a real shy young kid. So he goes on campus and all these kids have these, you know, nice clothes and they're able to go out for the pizza and weekends and do whatever. And Larry had absolutely nothing. He had, you know, one pair of jeans and he had like three shirts or something like that. He was totally overwhelmed, intimidated by the situation and he just couldn't deal with it. And he left the campus and he went home and he worked for a year for the local municipal company. And he was literally picking up trash on Tuesday and Thursdays. And that was his job. He was so think about this. One of the all time greatest athletes in Boston history, one of the greatest NBA players of all time might have never happened. He might have spent his entire life in Indiana picking up garbage on Tuesday and Thursday. And, you know, what a what a waste of a, a unbelievable talent that would have been. But he was such a great high school basketball player that the boosters from Indiana state started to find out what was going on with Larry Bird. And they convinced him to go to Indiana state. And of course the rest is, is history beyond that. But all of that stuff with his history and his, his, his dad who had alcoholic uh, problems and depression, all of that is all revealed as part of this museum. So 
there's a lot of video as you walk through with different screens and I'm the one that narrates uh, all of this stuff. And I can tell you this, I don't know. I, I hope they don't mind if I say it, but the material of all the stuff that I read was written by Jackie McMullen and Bob Ryan. Really? They, yep, they wrote it all. And um, so I think it's going to be a great place for, for Celtic uh, fans. It's, it's interesting. I threw it out on, <clears throat> on Twitter with a link to the site. And I had a lot of uh, Bostonians getting back to me last night saying, Oh, the wife and I were going to the Cape this July. Now we're going to Terre Haute. We're changing <laughs> <up."> <laughs> <Yeah. clears throat> and as you might know, Bobby, you might know this in French Lick, there is a great golf course. I believe it's a uh, two courses on that French Lick resort or whatever. I, I know mean, I've been to that French Lick resort. Oh my years. God. That course is unbelievable. Yeah. Right. It, I've, had a, I've been at a convention there as a matter of fact, but it was, you know, that have, Having said all that, I the whole story is, I mean, Bird, Walton, there's a symmetry it, 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 to it all. And it, let me just quickly diverse this, Lynchy, and I want your opinion on, on this too. And I know it, it, it's almost uh, sacrilege to bring in uh, present day players and, and start to compare, but those two guys were two of the greatest players in basketball of all time. But when you talk about greatest Celtics of all time, I think Jason Tatum will ever be in that. You know, if he continues and this team continues this run, do you think as we move into the the, the present day uh, iteration of the Boston Celtics in the NBA, do you think Tatum will ever get to the point of, of you know, Russell, Bird, McHale, or Havlicek, or that, that level? What do you think, Lynch? Well, what do you think? He's got a... Lynchy's got, it, Lynchy's got it right now. Okay. Right. It's he's got to win championships. If if the Celtics win this year, and I truly believe they're going to win this year. I think I told you this, you guys, this uh a year ago before the season began. I told you I thought this team was going to win it because I think, first of all, they're talented, they're deep. And I think, like anything else in life, you have to fail before you succeed. And I think these guys have had their moments of failure. And if they have learned from that, I think they're on deck and ready to finally take the crown. So if Jason Tatum ends up, and I think this team right now, the way it's constituted, and I think Brad Stevens has done an unbelievable job in putting this roster together, and he's got everybody locked up with the exception of Derek White. And my understanding is that they have plans to be able to lock up Derek White, the final piece to the puzzle. I'm going to tell you they're going to have a, a four-year window. All right, maybe five with one player leaving after three or four, something like that. But have the main nucleus here for a little, a short period of time, because that's all you get in this day and age in the NBA, four or five years. If they could win two of those, then yeah, we're thinking about Tatum. I mean, you guys look back in, in the 80s, that Bird uh, team should have won five. Yeah. You know, McHale's ankle broken <laughs> in, in 1987. And then Larry's uh, fight at the Chelsea bar with his, uh, his hand in, in 85. So they could have won two more, right? They could have won five. So I think if Tatum wins three with this group, and I think it's very capable of doing it, then why wouldn't we 10 years from now be talking about Tatum when he's retiring or whatever? Why wouldn't we be talking about him as one of the all-time great Celtics. You know, we didn't talk about Pierce in, in, in that in that group. Tommy Heinsohn was talking about him. He said he thought he was the greatest offensive player in, Reds, in, in Celtics history. But people weren't putting him in that group until when? Until 2008, and they won. And then they had a few other seasons where, again, that team should have won. But they had the Perk injury in 2010. That killed them. Rasheed Wallace. They brought Rasheed Wallace out on the floor. I, I could get up and down the floor better than Rasheed Wallace. And they and obviously that was a disaster. They they had a 13 point lead in the clinching game in, in game seven in Los Angeles. I was there. And they blew it because Rashid could not get up and down the floor. He right. couldn't run. So you can look at, and that's what gets me a little bit with the way people are talking about this team right now, guys. In that, yes, I, I think their road to the finals has been easy. That is a fact. We can't avoid that. There were injuries. When you lose Jimmy Butler to Miami, you lose the heart and soul of that team. When you lose Mitchell, when you lose Allen, when you lose three different guys in the Cleveland series, 
Yes, that is a factor. And obviously, when you lose Halliburton in this series against Indiana, it's a factor. So I'm not disputing it at all. But we can go through history, and I just pointed out a couple of them to you. The Lakers won in 2010 because of an injury to the Celtics and a key point in a series. That's how you win. You need to get lucky. You need to be healthy. It happens. Nobody's going to put a freaking asterisk on the, the Boston Celtics for 2024 if they win this championship. Five years, six years from now, nobody will remember that it was an easy run to get to the finals. It's just that's part of the game. It is. And it, it irritates me a little bit because I think it takes away from some of the things that, that Tatum has done. It seems to me Jalen Brown, who at a lower ceiling, is getting a lot more credit because he's come up really big in some of these games. Uh, but this is a really good team. I, I think they need poor singers in this last series. I watch, I watch every NBA game. I've never watched more games in my life now that I'm, I'm retired. I, I vowed to my wife and my family, I'll stop watching all those games. I watch more games than ever. <laughs> but um, I, I would say this, this, this team is really good, but they need poor singers against Dallas or should it be Minnesota, which I don't think it'll be, but they against either one of those teams, they need poor singers. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, you know, we, we, we pop on Twitter every day and, and you see the, the 86 Celtics or a, a, a little reel of Larry Bird or something and you go, wow. I I will get the opposite feeling when I'm looking at a reel of Jason Tatum because he'll be backing somebody in and backing somebody in and going one-on-one. -on -one. But that's not his fault. That's today's game. That's the culture that he was reared in, in AAU. And that's what the NBA has become right now. Uh, re rarely do you see the ball touch. It runs across half court. It really touches more than two sets of hands. Correct. So well, the, the other thing that irritates me is when I hear – people in our generation who sit there and say, I can't stand the NBA today, you know, and the Celtics need to stop taking so many threes. No, they don't look at the statistics of teams of attempts in three point attempts and three point percentage. Go look at the statistical list for the NBA for this season. And you will find all of the top teams in the league up at the top because that's the game in 2024. You take a zillion threes. It, it, you can take more of them because you get an extra point for them versus taking two point shot. And here's where the game is different. You'll see an individual player take 15 like Steph Curry or even a uh, Tatum 13, 14, 15, three pointers in a game. And people say that's ridiculous. Well, the game was different in the eighties. Larry bird averaged taking two and a half, three point attempts per game. That's all he took because the game, and by the way, many of them were at the end of a quarter when he was firing it up from 75 feet. Yeah. That was a different game. It was an inside game. Okay. It was an isolation game, by the way. They changed the rules to open up zone defense because players like Larry Bird would take a smaller player down on the block and just back him in, back him in, back him in. Mikhail would do the same thing and turn the guy inside out about three times. That was the game in the 80s. That's not the game today. The game is much different. The game is a go inside, drive inside to kick it back out to an open guy because the defense has collapsed inside to pick up the driver. And now you got a guy wide open like Holiday on the wing. And that's the other great thing about the Celtics. They have five guys that can score at any given time. So if you want to overplay Tatum, you want to, you know, you know, go ahead, trap them all you want. Trap him in the perimeter, uh, uh, collapse on him in the lane. Three guys will collapse on him in the lane. Kick it out, you get wide open three. That is the NBA game. You're right, Mike. It is totally different game. I mean, I, I remember you used to referee those uh, Celtics practices. You probably you probably remember the sure. game was just back down, back down, back down. Let me get down to the the block and and then you know see if I can I, I can outsmart you. I can you know change direction. And, and mess you up. And I think some people have trouble with the game, the, the three-point shots, um, because everybody can make them now. Yeah. I mean, the big guys can make them. Al, yeah, Al Horford was not a three-point shooter in Atlanta. Go look it up. The yeah. last year he was in Atlanta, he learned how to make a three-point shot. Why? Because he finally realized 
this game is changing and I'm getting left behind. I can't play down the old game down on the block anymore. So he learned how to hit threes and look at him now. Ever you make, me smile, you hit threes. Up, you make me smile because you brought up Lynchy referee and I can see him getting up and down the floor. <laughs> Just like Rasheed Wallace. He and he and Kenny Hudson. Remember Kenny or Hudson. Kenny Hudson was yeah. an old NBA official. Kenny well, was about five six. four. About <laughs> five four. I could post Kenny up, you know. <laughs> is he, like, uh, I, I tell you what. Those scrimmages that we refereed, I took more abuse than Jake O'Donnell ever took because they were so competitive. It was like every one of those scrimmages was like game seven of the NBA finals. Walton, Scott Wedman, yeah. all the guys on the green team with, with Bill Walton, they wanted to beat the ass off uh, of the starters, and they went at it, and this was unbelievable. We, we just had this conversation. Uh, Swallow the whistle, Mike. <laughs> yeah, we, we we just had this conversation uh, recently. As you guys know, Mikhail is one of my one of my neighbors, and Jerry Seesting was in town, and we all get together, and we were having these conversations about uh, those scrimmages and how the 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 second team, you know, they were so competitive. I mean, Danny Ainge was like fired up, like you know, trying to get his guys going or whatever. Yeah, but Ainge read in the Globe that his wife wouldn't let him go to the Dead concert. I think that's probably true, Bobby. I can't <laughs> verify. Michelle, I can't verify, but I would say, yeah. Okay, one more thing I just need to bring up about this upcoming Celtic matchup because it's only uh, added drama with Kyrie Irving. Oh, I can't imagine at least the first couple games, which will be here in Boston. Uh, and I hope it's Dallas at this particular point because of that. Although I, Minnesota does scare me. I mean, because they've got such size know, up front, yeah, great players, yeah. Uh, but the Kyrie Irving uh, Luca uh, parlay is really going to be fascinating here, and when if it comes back to Boston. So when you look at the series, and a lot of times in the NBA, um, usually the team that wins is the team that has the best player on it. And I think if we're going to be honest. Luka Doncic is the best player if we're putting a series together of Boston and Dallas, right? I mean, that's fair to say. Uh, I guess you could make an argument that, you know, Tatum would be number two, though I've heard a lot of people the way Kyrie is playing right now that say that Kyrie is number two and then the next five are members of the of the Boston Celtics. But the, here's the, the caveat that I, I, I've got to see it play out before I'm willing to buy in to the new Kyrie Irving. Since he stomped on on Lucky at the at the Boston Garden, he has been a disaster against the Celtics. Yes, that crowd gets him in, into his head, and he kind of loses his cool. Right now, he's playing free and easy, and there's no question that Kyrie is as talented a ball handler that has ever played in the NBA. There's no denying that. Okay, the things he can do and the way he can get to the rack. But when he gets into Boston, those people get into his head. So you're right, Bobby. That is the dynamic of that. There are two great stories here, storylines, to me, that, de that deal with it's personal. One is Kyrie with the Boston fans after he told There's them. There's no question have me, that that I'll is going to be ex ex no explosive, explosive. Here's the other one. Porzingis got blamed for everything in Dallas. Luca got blamed for nothing when the, yeah, right, the right. shit hit the fan down there. And Porzingis was not happy. And other players came out and said Luca and and Chris Stops did not get uh, along with each other because they were constantly pointing fingers at each other and blaming each other and having arguments in the locker room. You don't think that's going to be? in their heads right now, if I'm poor singers, I'm coming back and playing in that series. And I'm saying, I'm going to go win a championship and I'm going to prove to the people in Dallas. Don't blame me. It wasn't my fault. I think those two storylines are going to be phenomenal in this series. Cause they don't necessarily deal with basketball. They I deal know, with that's, it's that's personal. The about it. It, it, personal. They don't necessarily deal with basketball. That's, that's the backdrop of, of at least what it would be the first two games, which makes it's great. It's great to have a villain coming yes. into a series, you know. Yes. I mean, yes. think and Chris Stops will be a villain down there. He'll be a villain in Dallas. Yeah, I mean, uh, Ulf, Ulf Samuelson with Pitts, he was yes. a villain when he came yes. to town. Uh, Chris Nunn was always a villain when he came to town. Yep. And 
you know, there's all guys. Th- Ron Dennis was always a villain when he got on the air. <laughs> 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 but I think it's going to be a fascinating series. I do think it's going to be Dallas, though. I would, I think I might put my money on Minnesota tonight. I think it's going to go six and they're going to go back to Dallas. I think Dallas screwed up. You don't win that fourth game. You give that other team life. They yeah. go back home with their home fans. They're going to be pumped and jacked. And, you know, I, but I think the, the, getting back to what you were saying earlier, Lynchy, about, about Tatum and what Tatum does is he'll just pound the ball out in the wing and he'll attract one guy and then he'll attract the second guy or whatever. You can't play ISO ball against Dallas. The one thing that's been the big difference in Dallas this year, because the first half of the season, they were a terrific offensive team, especially with that backcourt. But then they made trades. They got Daniel Gafford, the uh, the the center. Lively, the, the kid from Duke, the rookie, has yep. emerged and gone to the next level. They got the, the P.J. Washington from, from Charlotte. He's a really good defensive player. They'll try to get him, lock him maybe on um, on, on Tatum. But their the defense is the difference in that team. They were a terrible defensive team the first half of the season. After that trade, certainly the last two months of the regular season, they were clamping down on people, but they were clamping down on ISO ball. So if you're Joe Missoula, my guess is, looking at all these videos, what Boston will do is, especially with Porzingis, where he can stretch out the floor, they're going to start a lot more movement with the ball. That's going to be what they're going to do, movement, and we'll catch them on switches the other thing I think you can do is I think you can wear down Doncic at the defensive end. I mean, for such a great basketball player, does yeah. if you were to see him and, and just watch him, does anybody think he's in, like, great shape? I'm sure he is, but he just doesn't look no, like it. Seems- kind of rumbles up and down the floor. Rumbles. Yeah, it seems to me. Like, yeah. Rumble. yeah, it seems to me you can wear him down. That's the way the we end. run up and down the floor. We just rumble. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think it could be a terrific series, maybe, but I, I still like Boston. I think it's a. Well, you got to like, I just love, I can't, the first two games will be explosive because of the whole Kyrie thing. If that's what yes. Yes. To. I mean, I wonder if he's going to come in and remember he, he burned uh, the sage. Well, yeah, the sage, sage stuff in, right. burn, burn the sage. Yeah. Well, I wonder if he's going to do that. that. That'll be cute. The fire he says, it's going to be noted. Believe me. And, uh, well, who knows? But hang on just a second. You've been through this before, Glenn. Mike, you've been through this more times than you care to even talk about. No, no, this will be different. This, this is going to be different. This will be different because Glenn's, get ready, get, you know, Glenn's Glenn, taking Glenn, get ready to hit the curveball, all right? Right. Glenn's I could never hit a curveball. <laughs> it's about, no, no, neither can the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> or the it is, ball, it is cruel. That's or the cruel. sweeper, that's, or that's, whatever, they're, whatever they're throwing a sweeper. Let's not that, get started on... That is, right. that is that is cruel. They're doing pretty well for what you what, saw. I mean, you're yeah, talking about for 500 team. They'll still be 73 wins, 74 wins. But no, I mean, and then, you know, they'll be two or three games out of the playoffs. And you know, you, you, you know, it's, you know, it's the worst. Chris Sale is like seven and one with like a one four zero earn on average. Yeah, Why can't we get guys different. like that, Bob? Jesus, Chris can't play second base. It's just <laughs> wait, I can't. We get all right, campers. Hold on a second, Glenn. Come on, you're making me laugh. It's mayhem all month, and the month is at the end here because the Celtics play June 6th. That's their first game. And by then, well, you'll still get a great deal. Mayhem all month at Cold Springs RV. For the first time in their history, their campers kickoff event will be all month long, which is not so much long anymore. They call it mayhem. So maybe you'll get there pretty damn quickly. Cold Springs RV in May with every 2024 model price to move you can get plenty of campers to visit the grateful dead get on go on tour walton was there my son was a deadhead go on you know been there i didn't think he had he didn't have a volkswagen bus but i'm sure he slept in a few so the point is they have a handful of 2023 20, models available up to 50 percent off so go visit cold springs rv route 114 in where new hampshire where? Where? Well, it's west of Gopstown, <laughs> north of Tingsboro. Tell them Lobie, Lynchy, and if I might add, the big O sent you. Co- online, ColdSpringsRV.com. <laughs> Thank you for letting us use your name in that commercial plan. Mike, what's the question? All right. We've had this question before. Cold Springs RV is going to build a Lobie Lynchy cruiser. It's still yep. in production stages, Glenn. But yeah, it yep. used to be a Lobie cruiser, but then they yeah, added, it used to be a Lobie cruiser, but yeah, but then they added on a back door. <laughs> All right. So we asked the question: the Lobie Lynchy cruiser 
drives cross country, you're driving. Now I asked you for one person. This is going to be different because I think you're going to invite Bill Walton. All right. But I could be wrong. This time you're going to pick up at any point in the ride. You could all start in the same spot, but you're riding cross country. You need five people on that bus with Bill Walton. That's if you pick him. If you don't pick him, you can pick somebody else. But they can be musicians, coaches, players, uh, anybody you want who think will make a fascinating conversation cross country. So who you can't bring so, Shepherd. So five <laughs> so five guys. Let me so I've got Bill Walton with me. So he's riding uh, side saddle. Um, I think the first person we're going to pick up will be uh, Kendrick Perkins because I want Walton to try to see if he can interpret what the hell <laughs> Perk is talking about. So Perk goes on ESPN yesterday and talks about how disappointed he is in the Boston Celtics yeah, because they didn't even sweep one of these first three teams they just played. <laughs> Perk, they just swept the Indiana Pacers. OK, the last team they played. You should remember that. OK, he didn't remember that. So I think I think my friend uh, Bill Walton certainly uh, would be able to uh, to to educate him. I, I think that's the the first place that uh, that we start. So where do we go uh, from there? Well, I, I, I guess we go to the uh, to the Midwest. And if I'm going to pick up a couple of guys, I, I think I'm going to pick up Scott Wedman because I think we're going to have some conversations that, you know, nobody talks about Scott Webman. He's an interesting guy. He's running real estate now in Kansas city. And he was there in 86. Yeah. Fascinating guy. And he was a big part of that team, but people yeah. don't talk about him. They just don't talk about him. And then, well, I mean, look at the surrounding cast. I mean, if you look at the surrounding cast, how would you ever get to Scott Wedman? Exactly. But but he was a big part of it. I can remember there are certain games in which you know Wedman would see sit. him coming up the floor. We'd sit in those, you know, the end zone seats. Yep. Lynch and I, and actually Dennis was sitting there once in a while too. We <laughs> yep. were sitting there, and Wedman would be leading the fast break. I mean, that, that was Scott Wedman. All right. So my last two is I pick up my buddy uh, Jerry Seesting. And then we go over to Ralph Sampson's house and we pick him up. Okay. And I say to the two of them, okay, let's finish it. All right. We had, unfortunately, unfortunately, the fight was interrupted. We had to play a stupid basketball game. So you let's get you out Glenn. there. You remember let's Johnny finish Most, the fight. Let's go. Do you, you remember Johnny Most called that ceasing Ralph Sampson? You know, this is the way they do things out here. They always pick on the little guy. The little guy. <laughs> remember that? I do. <laughs> I do, but that would be my trip, Lynchy. That would be my my guys, and we would have we would have a blast. Last time I took Red out there, and we were smoking cigars the whole way, so that's good. I was going to ask you if you had, if you had to open the windows a little bit and crack the windows for for this five some. Well, I would open the windows, but you know, uh, absolutely open the windows for the five some. <laughs> What's your best me? Johnny Most story? With Glenn? Walton there. Uh, What's that? What's your best Johnny Most story? My best Johnny Mo story, and you can relate to this because you spent some time working <laughs> with Johnny Mo's. You can relate to this. We're there are so many stories, Bob. I, I mean, you and I could probably write a book on this, but um, we're in Dallas. Um, Johnny is is really upset because they had just changed the state laws in Texas, and they banned smoking in public places. What a lot of people don't know, especially young people is that you used to be able to smoke on airplanes, okay? And you used to be able to smoke in public places. I mean, in the 80s, when the Celtics, early 80s, when the Celtics were playing, we were flying commercial planes, and then they changed the rules, and you could no longer smoke on, on planes. So I can tell you that we had numerous uh, events on those planes where Johnny would go back into the, the, the uh, restroom he would light up and not realizing it had an alarm in the restroom and the alarms would sound off. <laughs> okay. So we're in Dallas now and now it's becoming a reality. So Johnny is really getting frustrated because society is changing on us and they're not allowing anybody to smoke in public. And this is really rattling Johnny because he was a chain smoker. I don't know, three, four packs a day, something like that. Terrible. A, a lot. Just one right after. And when we're doing games, that's why he kept on burning himself and lighting himself on fire because he had to have two going at one time because he's doing play by play, right? He's doing play by play. So you got to have one, but you got to have the other one ready because you don't have time to stop and, and light it. You're, you're, you're working. So we're in Dallas and 
uh, Johnny starts smoking in the in the media room. And they come up to him. The PR person for the Mavericks comes up to him and says, I, I'm sorry, sir, you can't you can't smoke in here where it's it's been banned. What do you mean it's been banned? What, what is this banning? And he's getting, you know, like the way Johnny would get. He would get really irritable and he would start lashing out at the person. So he was giving the guy a lot of heat. So he puts it out. And about 15 minutes later, he lights another one up. And finally, the Dallas uh, management people have the Stadies come and, and talk to him. So the Stadies go and, and talk to him. And they basically say, you can't smoke there, sir. And he gets belligerent, gets belligerent. So I'm out of there now because I've got to go do pregame show stuff and whatever. So I'm on the, on the table and we're ready to start the, the broadcast. The game is going to start. Johnny would always come right for the start of the game. This is Johnny Bowes right, right high above court side. And he would do that opening. That would always be his opening. There's no Johnny. They're going to me one minute. I said, where's Johnny? 30 seconds. Where's Johnny? No Johnny. Okay. So I had to open up the broadcast in Dallas. And I had seen him like a half an hour before. You know where he was? He was in the clink. They had locked him up. <laughs> they had locked him up in the in the Dallas jail. <laughs> so we so Jan Voke has to go down there and and bail him out. And he comes back in the broadcast. We're halfway through the first quarter now, and he's putting on his headphones and wrapping them around and trying to get him on. And I said, I looked at him and I'm doing the play by play. And I said, Are you okay? Let me tell you something. There are probably 6,000 rapes right now going on in Dallas. There are probably 1,500 robberies going on in Dallas, but they have to arrest me for smoking my cigarette. He is <laughs> screaming at the top of his lungs. The whole broadcast was absolutely hilarious because he was so off. He was so off. He couldn't. I mean, in the middle of doing play-by-play, -play, you know, Bird's taking these unbelievable shots, and Johnny's gone, but do you believe they locked me up? Do you believe they what they did here in Dallas and Texas? What is this, Russia? You know, he was like, oh, my God. But they locked him up. They locked him up. He learned his lesson. And so at that point, he had to suddenly learn that you just can't smoke in, in, in public. He loved it when we went over, to, uh, went over to Madrid in 1987, and we walk into the locker room of, a, at that time, the Yugoslavian team and the, the Italian team were part of the McDonald's Open Tournament. It was the first time an NBA team was playing over in, in Europe. And we walk into the Yugoslavian locker, and they were all sitting there smoking cigarettes. And Johnny <laughs> felt right at home. Johnny lights up a cigarette in the Yugoslavian locker room and said, oh, this is great. I am, I am I'm right at home. I don't, the last time I saw a Boston athlete smoke a cigarette, you guys probably remember, was Carl Yastrzemski. And yeah. he has, used to have an ashtray, and he'd have it taped onto his little, his little chair, <laughs> his little stool. God, but those were the days when you could smoke, and obviously the, those were changing, and John really had trouble with the change. <laughs> to say the least. Oh, wow. my God. Was he one of a kind? Yep. Oh, my goodness. Uh, hey, um, what do you think about the, the possibility of the NBA going to NBC and the TNT show inside the NBA being extinct? Yeah, I'm not happy about that. I um. I, I think that show is is terrific. Awesome. I, I, the entertainment aspect of it. Um, Charles, I'm about to be fired. Oh, my God. <laughs> Have you ever seen anybody, though, that, especially when we've gone through this cancel culture, and hopefully we're getting out of it right now, but because I think we're all a little too sensitive. But have you ever seen anybody, though, that is, is totally um, cancel-free than Charles Barkley? I mean, he can say what he say whatever he wants. If right. anybody else says it, I don't even think it's a a, a racial thing. I I, I think no, if another no, black guy would say it, he'd be in trouble. You know what I mean? He's it's so good, so good. Yeah, and he's and it's spontaneous. And the funny thing about it is, I, I, I've talked to people at, at TNT. He doesn't do an awful lot of uh, uh, preparation. I mean, I hate to say it, but Johnny didn't do an awful lot of preparation. It was all entertainment. Johnny had the, he, he had the, the script down the script being, I'm going to be entertaining. I'm going to, you know, put the, the, the white hat on and they're, they're the black cats. And, but that's what Charles does. I mean, if you watched him on the uh, March madness, 
I don't think he's ever seen any of those teams play before. Oh. <laughs> it's like, it's like, and and you sit there and go, but he's still good. How is that possible? A guy does no homework, has no idea about the players and and what they do in their style, and he's sitting there and he's one of the most vocal people on there. So I I'm going to really miss that show. Ernie Johnson really just knows how to handle yeah. those guys. You you know you talk about um, uh, being able to 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 work the table. He works the table and there's plenty of information. And when there's bad information, what I love about that crew is they get on each other. That's the yeah. stupidest thing I've ever heard of. That's dumb information. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> and I think they have done a great job with the production crew of being able to utilize Twitter to be able to come yeah. up with funny tweets right away. Yeah. And so obviously they've got some guys out there that are, that, that are their guys, their Twitter artists, if you want, who yeah. are setting them up with stuff, but that stuff is funny as hell. And I, I hope NBC and you know, you guys know how it works. It's um, it's all done. I, NBC is going to try to promote and use people that already are in house. Yeah. That's what networks do. I think the ESPN studio show is horrendous right now. Horrendous. Horrendous. The worst so, I've ever seen. So let me give you an example of it. And I like Michael Wilborn. He lives, by the way, here in Scottsdale. So I know my, and, and I like Michael. The problem with Michael is Michael is, is doing a 2024 NBA studio broadcast. And he's still living 20 years ago in the NBA. I don't think Michael follows it that well. I mean, he knows the game, but I don't think he follows that well. I'm amazed when he sits there and I see him at halftime and he'll say, oh, my God, like the first game against Denver. I can't believe Minnesota's defense. Did anybody think Minnesota's defense was this good? Well, that's what got them the number two seed during the course of the season. Yes, their defense was that good. So, And then Stephen A., is you know I, I he he's built himself an unbelievable shtick. Okay, I give him all the credit in the world, and I knew him when he was starting. So he has built himself an unbelievable shtick, but it's all shtick. Yeah, and, and that's not the form. That's not what you want to get at that particular part uh, on that particular show. No, the you show is to, terrible. You want to get it on the first take or Sports Center or wherever else he wants to deliver it with Molly and that crew. Yeah, not on that show. Yeah, so I'm really disappointed because I, you guys know how the business works. NBC is going to do something safe. You know, I've already heard they're bringing the John Tesh theme back, and they're already talking about that. And if they're going to do that, they're not going to try to reach out to a whole new audience. As you guys know, as we get older, you, we see the changes, and you either go along with the changes or you get lost in the cycle. It's all changing, and you've got to be able to reach out to to – new fans and different fans. And yet you look at the TNT crew. That's not a young crew. Ernie Johnson is my age. That's not a young crew. And yep. yet they are able to reach uh, that young, uh, the young audience, that whole shtick they do where they send you off to Cancun when you get eliminated. The first time it was, ex it was extremely funny. It's still funny. How is that still funny? <laughs> I mean, you would think that would be, you know, a one and gone shtick, right? It is yeah. still funny as hell. And they put all the different people on the boats and they've now jazzed it up using green screen and everything else to really, you know, make it look look really, really good. But what, what, you're what right, Lynchy. I'm going to miss that show. Uh, so let me get the, they have one more year to go. One more right? year. One yeah. more year. Yeah. Um, and like, and you, go ahead. And you know, Charles will make a big deal. They'll make a big deal about the last year. They'll constantly. Oh yeah. It'll, it'll be, it'll be part of the theme of yeah. that last year. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it could be like, like Charles will say, well, I won't have to go to Minnesota again. It's snowing. Right. You know, he still thinks it's snowing there right now. <laughs> I saw, I saw <laughs> <laughs> couldn't go. He could, couldn't go for a walk in Dallas because it was too hot. <laughs> so do you, do you remember last year? He, what he did, he uh, ridiculed the women in San Antonio. Do you remember that <laughs> yeah, one? Yeah. Who, could, who, that who one. could get away with that? You're right. How do you get away with that? Yeah. It's unbelievable. And everybody laughed and nobody, nobody sat there and said he needs to be canceled. That, you know, misogynist, yeah. that's, that is ridiculous. He can get away with it. So how does he get away with it? And nobody else gets away with it. I, I'm happy he's getting away with it because I think to me, it's, it's great entertainment. And I know him a little bit and he's, 
you know, he's not a, a, a vicious person. He's just the opposite. No. He's harmless, you know. <laughs> you know, he used to get in, into a, a lot of mischief when he was uh, younger, when he was a player. And remember, he had that famous line, I'm, I'm not anybody's role model. Yes. And, and, and I think a lot of that turned a lot of people off. Did. Um, Do you think he was right? He was. Was he right? Yeah. Yeah, I think he was right, too. I do, too. Um, but but at the time, I did not think he was right. Maybe I'm getting, I'm mellowing with age. But 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 he's turned into a completely different guy. He's very embraceable. He's very lovable by all ages, both genders. And he really is, he's got to be part of somebody's show. Yeah, I think he'll get hired somewhere. Somebody will bring him along. But I'm not sure, again, it's all about the philosophy of NBC. Is NBC going to delve into that territory? I mean, ESPN is doing it right now. They've taken that step, and I wonder whether they regret it with the Pat McAfee show. So, yeah. uh, you know, they're willing to do that, though McAfee owns the show. Um, they're willing to do that right now. They tried that one, <laughs> if you remember, that one show they did with Barstool Sports that lasted one night, yeah. and then it was off the air by the next day. Because when you go and you bring somebody in, or a, a, a production in that is going to cross that line, certainly going to, you know, hang on that line. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of challenges there. You could, you could get yourself in a lot of trouble. And I just think NBC is going to take the safe route. There's going to be too much money involved in the investment of the rights fees. They're just going to play it straight. And to me, that's just going to be boring. I, I, I want entertainment. That's yeah. that's I think that's part of the game. I think that's why you guys were so successful. I mean, the zany things that Crazy Bob used to do, you know, he, he, you know, he had four and a half, three and a half, four and a half minutes at night. And people would remember, you know, the panic button. They would remember. Why can't we get guys like this? P people <laughs> remember it to this day because yeah. it was shtick that 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 could last. That had it had, um, you know, it had life to it. It's and sports, it was entertaining. Man. That was it. The philosophy was it's only sports. That's it. That's it. I mean, please. That's that's why they dropped you twenty minutes into the into the newscast. They put the news ahead of you. They put weather ahead of you. And we all the knew the weather. weather. We knew what the well, weather was, and they still buried you behind the weather. Well, and a couple of car accidents and, and fires. Uh, <laughs> hey, let me get. We'll see you in a couple of weeks, Glenn. Quick, quick spot in here. Hold, hold on before we uh, wrap things up right here. Hey, if you're thinking about a new vehicle, go where Loby and Lynchy and, and tons of our friends go. Go see our friend George Gray at George Gray's Lexington Toyota. We've been customers for years because we know George Gray will treat you right. They're a family-owned and operated dealership that we trust and you can trust as well. Go see the big wheel, George Gray at George Gray's Lexington Toyota, 409 Mass Ave, in Lexington, Mass. All right, so Big O, we got June thirteenth, HOF, right? Yes. Are you going to yep. start signing your 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 name now, Glenn Ordway, Ooh. HOF? I don't know. Do you guys do that? Can you do that? Uh, I haven't you done can that. Do it. Anybody? Then what do you mean HOF? What's that mean? <laughs> That's what you get. So why bother? I know what I I know. I've never tried it actually. Lynch, you've tried it, right? No. no. Oh, I've done I've done it I've done it once, but I signed it Wade Boggs H O V H O F. <laughs> yeah, that's how I signed it. No. Um, and then today we're, we're taping this on Thursday, May thirtieth, which is the unveiling of the Larry Bird Museum. Larry Bird Ontario, Museum right? opens up. They're they're doing a, a special private uh, opening today for the community and the people there. And Larry's unveiling it and cutting the ribbon or whatever they do. I give him the key. I I don't know. And then it officially opens to the public tomorrow. Okay, well, thirty first. Thirty first. Congratulations to you, Bob Ryan, Jackie Mullen, for your role in doing that. Yeah, that obviously, that. you know, the, the, it was easy reading scripts from from those two because I I knew there weren't going to be an awful lot of mistakes. You yeah. Know? Okay. Uh, I they were going to be question. particular. One final question for both of you guys, uh, and it, it involves Kyrie Irving coming back to Boston. Has there ever been a situation that you? With an athlete that played here, Kyrie played here, left here, and comes back as hated as he is. Has there ever been, you know, Clemens comes to mind. Clemens, uh, Clemens, Clemens would be uh, one. Um, Parcells uh, was. Uh, oh no! Who? who, who uh, why can't I think of uh, Johnny Damon? 
Johnny Damon. Johnny Damon. But oh, Johnny Damon got Johnny Damon. Every time he stepped to the plate in the Yankee uniform, there'd be a chorus of booze nonstop. And, and that was unfair because he, he wanted to stay with the Red Sox and he asked the Red Sox to match the deal. The Yankees gave him and the, the Red Sox, um, we're throwing the bluff out there, sitting there going, the Yankees aren't offering you that money. That's not true. They're not offering you that money. And they were. They gave him a whole other year, and they gave him a lot more money. And so that they thought that he was just bluffing. They thought that he was making it all up. But he took more heat than anybody. Clemens took, obviously, heat. Bledsoe never got heat coming back that I remember in a Buffalo Bills uniform. No. No, trying to really? think of anybody else. Marcel's yeah, 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 didn't get any fist was fine. Um, because they blamed the, the club, not well. Fair. They screwed up. They didn't they didn't sign the uh the so-called option they were supposed to sign yeah. by December 31st. Yeah, so that so was a Haywood was Sullivan. Kyrie, Kyrie feeling uh, Glenn the Johnny Damon uh, is not the same kind of animosity that Kyrie is facing. Oh, that was a lot of animosity at the time, Bob. It was. Your what, memory is your memory is slipping. I thought the Damon yeah, thing is okay. We don't need to I thought it was bad it. and it, and it continued. The obvious. Yeah, and we're it continued. It was a three or four game series, and it happened hogs. every epic. Um, I don't remember. Maybe it was splintered. Maybe fifty fifty with uh, with Boggs. You know, there was there were so many things with Boggs with the the Margo and all that other stuff that was involved with Boggs. Hey, listen, don't get me wrong, Bob. This one is going to be pretty loud. I think, yeah. and I think here's the other one: the fans are going to know that they might be able to get into his head. So yeah. you're right. The first quarter of game one is in, in Boston is going to be fascinating to see how he reacts to it. Now, is he capable of putting earplugs in and just burying the sound and just playing his game? Because if he is, we know how good he is. We know that he can take over games, okay? And we know that he has a teammate that he can funnel the ball to and play two-man uh, basketball that can do a lot of harm in matchups against Boston, though I think Boston's uh, uh, backcourt is really good defensively. But they're these are two great offensive players. But for yeah. Dallas to win, Luka and, and Kyrie have to have great games. If yeah. you look at – they don't have a lot of other guys that can score. You know, every once in a while, Washington will give you some points. Jones will give you some points. Gafford. But you're not going to get a lot. They get the little kid, Hardy, that is their version of, of Peyton Pritchard coming off the bench. But – they don't have a lot of guys that can score. They really need Luca and Kyrie to both give them 30 plus. If you can keep them under 30, then you have a real good chance of winning. So the question is, Luca's going to get his. I just think he's so good. I don't care how well you defend him. He is just a, a marvelous player. I'm not going to say he's Larry Bird yet, but he has some of those moves that that Mr. Bird once had. And maybe when it's all said and done, we'll be talking about him in the same sentence. But if they can get into Kyrie's head, Dallas is in trouble in that series, in trouble. And I think the Boston fans are going to know that, and they're not going to give up. They're going to be all over his ass. Who, uh, who, uh, do you have um, Derek White or Drew, uh, Drew cover uh, Kyrie? Uh, I think you can have either one on Kyrie. I think it'll be interesting to see what they do with Doncic. My guess is that they'll probably double – Doncic, um, and he's so good at, at cutting into the rim. And the reason I say Porzingis, I said earlier, is so important. The one thing Boston did not do well in the Indiana series is defend the paint. Indiana, uh, I think Indiana was like 67 68% scoring yeah. in, in the paint. And a lot of that in Dallas series is going to be Luka. If Luka, Luka will hit that three and he'll hit it from 35 feet away and then fall into the crowd. But the other thing he'll do is he'll force you out, force a, a, a double team out there deep in the perimeter, and he'll take you off the, the dribble and then cut into the lane. If you have Porzingis back there as your rim protector, then Doncic has got to go through an awful lot if he wants to score. You make it really difficult for him to score. I think you're going to have to have Porzingis in this thing. But so I, I would say that they could put either one on those guys, but Doncic is the one that's going to get help. And it's going to be, you know, Washington's guy. It's going to be somebody who Jones's guy, somebody else that they're going to say, okay, we'll, 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 we'll let him drift underneath because we still have Porzingis underneath the rim. I love you guys. Thank you so much for the show. Great job today. 
great. Always show, fun. Dude. Always fun with you guys. And uh, I hope I'm going to see you here. You guys at the uh, Hall of Fame ceremonies. You yes, absolutely yes, will. Good. They bring you back. Do you wear your jackets? What color yeah, are the jackets? Yeah. Purple? What color are they? Um, the, This color right here. Uh, that color. Pistachio. <laughs> that's, nice. that's a nice color. That's and great. by the way, good luck trying to find your way into that Marriott and out of that Marriott. I mean, you could wind up like going to Cape Cod. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, Why is it so difficult to get into the Marriott? You can park on the Southeast Expressway and just kind of jump across the fence. Jump, jump down. You can see it. But you can't get there. God, you guys are sounding so old now. Get <laughs> off my parking lot. You know, Jesus. Okay, well, so you, old. What a shock. Well, I, I'll just have my chauffeur. Just drive me and <laughs> drop me off the front door. That's what right. I'll do. Yeah. You got it Great solved. job, Glenn. Thanks. So Great being Thanks with so you much. guys. We go, Great everybody. Hall of Famer and the best Cheers, of all guys. time. Thank Cheers. you, Glenn. We'll see everybody. And make sure you follow us on unanchoredboston.com. 